I get a bit blue between seasons of Why Dance Matters. I don't know why. I suspect it's as simple as just really missing the conversations. Recording episodes for this Royal Academy of Dance podcast gives us wonderful nuggets of human connection. Sitting down with strangers who are so generous with their time and hearts and minds, it never gets old. I'm David Jays. This is Why Dance Matters, and it cheers me right up to open the imaginary doors on our new season. Lucky number seven. What do we have in store? We have award-winning dancers and choreographers. We have young stars and late bloomers. We have inspiring people from across the world. But we start with one of the hardest working people in show business. Drew McConey is a British choreographer and theatre director. He danced with Matthew Bourne's New Adventures Company, but soon realised that he wanted to make dance himself. He staged a wonderfully witty Jekyll and Hyde, Strictly Ballroom in the West End, King Kong on Broadway, plus classic musicals, and original dance works. Drew seems crazy busy. This month he's opening a brand new version of the Nutcracker in a brand new London venue, giving the festive favourite a sweetly queer twist. And next year sees his stage version of the Oscar-winning movie The Artist, the one about silent movies and the very cute little dog. His work always hits a sweet spot between warm and witty with a kinetic fizz, so he should be perfect for that one. If that wasn't busy enough, he's just become a father. We're speaking a mere week after his baby was born, so will Drew be wired or too tired to speak? Let's find out. Drew, welcome to Why Dance Matters. And, very excitingly, you're working on everything in the world. You've got a new production of Nutcracker. You're preparing a musical based on the film The Artist. You've got a new baby. Do you sleep ever? (laughs) (laughs) That's a very good question. But I think as a person, I'm not much of a sleeper anyway. I haven't been since I was a child. So I feel like I'm I'm getting a good bit of karma right now with my baby not uh, allowing me to sleep because I don't think I let my parents sleep, to be honest. I was too busy daydreaming about doing things like Nutcracker and the artist. So really, it's just karma <laughs> coming out and nipping me in the butt. Were you that child? Were you the bouncing up and down on bits of furniture and running around madly child? Yeah, I mean, I was outrageous, to be honest. My granddad used to have this amazing old video recorder that he took everywhere. It was his pride. There's so many videos now of me just being uncontrollable. You know, my, my cousins are there, they're sort of saying what they're having for their dinner, and I'm jetting across the back, just basically being obnoxious and a total terror to anybody that I get to watch me perform. So I was absolutely that child. Yeah. Perfect. Imagine the payback now. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll talk a bit more, I suspect, about families as we go. But... I was walking on London South Bank last week and I went past the venue that is being transformed as we speak into the Tough Nut Jazz Club, which is going to be the venue for your production of The Nutcracker. And I think you've described it as a production for people who felt The Nutcracker might not be for them. What did you mean by that? Well, I mean, I think Nutcracker is one of the most extraordinary like properties and it's so much in the identity of Christmas. You know, it's one of those titles and those ballets that goes beyond just the dance audiences. This is a piece that sort of sits within the identity and within the very fabric of the Christmas festivities for pretty much everybody. People might not necessarily go and see the ballet, but the music is all the way through TV adverts, in films. It's kind of part of the soundtrack of everybody's Christmas, right? And I thought what was fascinating was 
you know, Nutcracker on stage felt like it belonged in a very sort of set position within the dance industry. And I wanted to create a Nutcracker to show that, that actually Nutcracker is for everybody, that there are people that might not feel like they want to go and see a ballet, but they do want to go and experience the music live on stage. And they want to see that music being exploded out into physical visual storytelling. So this Nutcracker, it's not an instead of, it's an as well as. And I, I think that, you know, Nutcracker is so richly enjoyed by classical dancers all over the world and at times contemporary dancers. But I really wanted to create a Nutcracker that felt like it was a production that the dancers from the music theatre industry and the jazz dancers, the theatre dancers, could feel like it was their opportunity to leap into that incredible music and have that really special experience of that music and that story connecting with Christmas audiences themselves in the way that I know the classical dancers enjoy doing Nutcracker also. It's really just that an additional chocolate in the chocolate box of the, of the different array of Nutcrackers that are on offer. And we were talking about families and the Nutcracker is, in its traditional productions, a ballet that presents a very traditional family. There are grandparents, there are stable parents, stable children. It's a very sort of fixed world. Did you also like the idea of slightly mixing that up and reflecting the wider range of family setups? Absolutely. I mean, I think that everything I do, I have to find a personal way into a story. I and mean, that's not to say that all the stories are about me or that the audience has to learn anything about me in it. What I'm trying to find in a piece is the humanity. I like the idea of creating theatre and creating dance that brings people together, that allows people to understand themselves, that provides an opportunity for them to feel a little bit less alone in the world. And so in order to do that, anytime I approach a story, I try to look for the humanity in it. And for me, what was interesting about Nutcracker was it exactly like you've just said, that actually traditionally Nutcracker follows quite a traditional or what, what's sort of known as a nuclear family. And, you know, for me, I'm a gay man and I've been on quite a long journey to start my family. It's, it's taken almost three years for my little girl to arrive and she's one week old today. And I think that that really gave me a desire to be able to create a Nutcracker that showed a slightly different family setup. In our Nutcracker, the traditional Clara character is replaced by Clive. And the journey that Clive goes on into dreamland is a kind of an expression of him trying to heal his relationship with his hardworking single father. Clive is quite a colourful, alternative, expressive, paints outside the lines kind of kid. His dad is from a different generation where he wasn't allowed to be that sort of expressive. He wasn't allowed to wear all the different colours and he wasn't allowed to taste all the different flavours. So this is a story that sort of charts the journey of two men's journey towards each other, a father and a son. And it also studies two men that are from different worlds almost. You know, the world is changing so quickly. So, so yes, family is very much at the heart of it, which I think Christmas really does lend itself well to. It's ultimately like family and acceptance. And I think that's where its unique intersection is sitting. When did dance enter the picture for you amid all the showing off and running around? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so basically dance started for me because when I was as young as infant school or nursery even, basically it was tidy up time. And I didn't like tidy up time. I used to pretend that I was magic. So I used to get a paintbrush. And I would basically, you know, dance around the room, sort of bibbity bobbity booing all the other children for doing tidy up time, <laughs> leaping on the sofas and stuff and dancing and and. Her name was Mrs. Erdley. She was my play school teacher. Said to my mom, "How long has Drew been going to dance classes? It's obviously really good of you to take a little boy to dance classes." And my mom was like, "We haven't taken him to dance classes. Like he just does this all the time." So I must have been very, very young. And Mrs. Erdley said, "I think maybe you should take him to dance classes because it might get rid of some of the excess energy. He clearly really likes it, and he might be able to concentrate a little bit better at school if he's a bit more tired." So my mom took me to my local dance school, Warsaw Academy of Dance when I was very, very little. And I remember turning up, I was the only boy in the class and we had to skip around and we were being fairies and we were being witches. And I hated it. And I, I basically wanted to quit straight away, But which is ironic because nowadays I'd love to dress around as a fairy and a witch. And I'll, <laughs> I'll absolutely be doing that with my daughter. So, I mean, it's the irony of giving up straight away because I didn't want to be a fairy is quite, is, you know, is, uh, the humour of that is not lost on me. And, and, and so I stopped. And then my cousin went to disco and freestyle dance classes and I went along with her 
And really, I think primarily as a bit of childcare, to be honest, I absolutely loved it. And it was, it was a real introduction to me because there was an element of freedom within the material. So I clocked very quickly that I could just be very forgetful about the dance steps that my teacher would give me because once we were out on the dance floor, nobody could reach me. So I would be making up my own steps. So I think in a way, when I got introduced to ballet and I was just being taught the steps, I didn't like it because I didn't like the fact that there were set things I was supposed to be doing because I had more fun making up my own steps. And then when I went to disco and freestyle, it was the perfect introduction for me because there was a certain freedom to it that to find my, the reason I loved to dance was because it was the making up of the dance really. So the next thing that happened was I decided to take up artistic residency in the football goalposts at school because I'd been taken to see a production of Joseph and the Technical Dreamcoat and I clocked what I now know as the Pross Arch of the theatre. And I thought it was very similar to the football goalpost. I took a participant residency in the football goalpost and I would put on my performances and of course didn't know any of the rules of football. And so whenever the, the, the lads would be kicking a ball at me, shouting me to get out of the way, I would say, well, you've got another one down the other end. There's another one over there. You can go and play that <laughs> one and I'm going to play on this one. So I think I just became a sort of subconscious goalie for them for quite a long time, <laughs> leaping about. And if they hit, managed to hit me with the ball, then so be it. So that's really how it all, all came in. But I don't really ever remember a time time before dance. I don't really remember being introduced to it because I was doing it before I went to a dance class. I don't know why that is, but I guess it, it's just something that was in me. It doesn't sound as if there was ever an agonising moment where you had to think, is this what I do with my life? It kind of feels as if the decision was made for you. Well, do you know what you say that there was? There was, there was a good two hour slot where I decided that I was giving it all up to become a vet because I really love animals. And then when my mom explained to me what vets actually do, I was heartbroken that they might have to look after very, very poorly animals and that sometimes poorly animals don't survive. Then I was distraught and the only way to cheer me up was to take me to my dance class. And actually, funnily enough, my, my ballet teacher from Tring when I went away to school messaged me a couple of days ago to say congratulations on, on the baby. I suddenly remembered being about 12 years old. It was my first year at school when I went away to Tring Park and marching into the dance office to tell them that I was going to move over to the drama course. And they were like, what, why do you want to move to the drama course? You're doing really well. And I said, well, because I've decided I'm going to have children one day and actors make a lot more money than dancers do. So I think it's better if I just start working hard now. But it wasn't until she congratulated me that I was like, yeah, this thing about wanting to have a family happened probably, you know, before I was even, you know, able to work out that I was gay or that it might be complicated for me to have a family. That's incredible. And you did start a dancing career and notably you performed with Matthew Bourne's New Adventures for several years, including his version of The Nutcracker. I think, were you horrid little Fritz, who's the spoilt, hideous child? I don't know what it is about me that would make you assume that, David. <laughs> I feel slightly attacked by that. <laughs> it was my first principal role within the company and I absolutely loved it. Because it's funny, when, when I was really little, I think I was a complete terror. I think I just needed to perform. And, but actually, as I've grown up, I'm, I'm actually quite the opposite to that now. Like, I wouldn't say I'm shy, but like, I, I, I can be quite quiet. And so I think there was like, an, there was an inner child in me that absolutely loved playing Fritz. And I, I think that the amazing thing about working with Matthew Bourne is that you're welcomed in as an actor as well as a dancer. And so the process you go through in order to perform for his audiences is one that you really are able to give something personal of yourself. And I think that my experience with other sort of dance situations has been very much in service of a singular voice. Whereas with Matthew, obviously, there is an exceptional singular voice there. But the way that he reaches that is through the kind of encouragement and the support of the dancers to really pour themselves into the opportunity. And so it was a life changing gift for me working with New Adventures because even though, you know, Matthew and I make work very different, I also put very much the sort of support behind the dancers, but the process through which choreography is made is very different between the two of us. And I think our work is very different. It was a golden opportunity for me to be inspired by him and watch his process and, and also be allowed into that, putting your, your own sort of personality into the performance. And were you already, through your dancing career, looking for choreographer inspiration or for role models or for, in fact, models of 
how you really wouldn't want to run a room or <laughs> lead a process. Was that already something you were thinking about? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think it was very clear to me, everything I did, right from going away to school, all the decisions were about wanting to be a choreographer. I mean, that, that's sort of what, what I told people all the time. And, and that goes back from a really sort of pivotal moment for me, which was I was the original little boy in The Snowman um, when I was very young and it was created in Birmingham, which is where I'm from. And that was choreographed by Robert North, who is, you know, amazing choreographer. And it was really, really informative because the way that show was made was very much, obviously Robert is like a brilliant choreographer, but he was working with these children. We were like, I don't know, like nine years old or something. And so he was very much like, so what would you do now? And I'd be like, oh, well, I think I'd go and throw a snowball. So he was like, okay, show me that. So I'd go and throw the snowball. And he'd be like, well, what about if you turn this way and put your foot down here? And he was very inclusive in the way that the show was made. And I used to, there was three, because obviously it was, we were triple cast because we were children. The other two lads would go, you know, they'd take their tea breaks, they'd go out and sit with their mom in the green room. And I'd never come out of the studio. I'd stay in in my tea breaks and I'd make up my own dances. And Robert clocked very quickly what I was doing and I was making up my dances. So he used to go and get a cup of tea and then he'd sit in the corner, he'd watch me making up my dances. And then bit by bit, I, my dances would just come more and more into the middle of the studio. And then bit by bit, he'd sort of encourage me and he'd say like, oh, have you ever thought about, you could do that step again if you wanted, but you could just do it facing a different way. Or started to, at a very young age, like encourage me into different sort of processes. And then I said, what do you do in the daytime? Because I was only rehearsing in the evenings because I was at school. And he said, I stay and I, I make up dances with the older dancers. And I was like, so you make up dances all day? And he said, yes. And I said, and you get paid for that? And he said, yes. And he said, he laughed. He's like, I hope, I hope you're getting paid for this. I said, well, I am. I said, but you don't have a real job. He said, this is my real job. So I, in that moment, my brain just went <laughs> like, there's a real job. What is this crazy world? And so I asked him to write down, uh, you know, he said it was a choreographer. I asked him to write it down because he didn't know how to spell it. And it was on a little green post-it note that was attached to his script. He took it off, wrote choreographer. And that was the first time I went out in the tea break to my mom. And I, I remember going out into the green room at the Birmingham Rep Theatre. And she looked panicked because she was like, oh, has something gone wrong? Because I don't usually come out in the tea breaks. And I said, no. And I gave her the post-it note. I said, that's what I'm going to be. I'm going to be a choreographer. And that was it really. So that was, you know, really from nine, I would tell people I was going to be, well, at first a choreographer and then a choreographer. And so really every decision, like through my training, an amazing group of very, very special best friends who all went on to have exceptional dance careers. You know, Tyrone Singleton, who's principal at Birmingham Royal Ballet, Carrie Johnson, who danced at Birmingham Royal Ballet and with Matthew Bourne, Katie Lowenhoff, principal with Matthew Bourne, Max Westwell, English National Ballet. These amazing group of very special, special dancers were my best friends at school. And they gifted me by like at the end of every school day we would meet in the studio and they would just let me choreograph on them you know I was sort of 10 11 and so having that support and that trust from a young age and then going off into my performing career every decision I made as a performer was about getting in the room with people I admired because it was all about learning and I thought it was going to take a lot longer than it did you know as a theatre choreographer there's no process for classical choreographers and contemporary choreographers, you very usually get into a major dance company and then you get nurtured by the artistic management and you're surrounded by the world's best dancers. And then you do the sort of choreodrome and you do the sort of scratch sharing platforms and you're sort of surrounded by the best to learn from. And then you're nurtured by the best. And then there's a, there's a direct pathway into having dancers and having performance lots and being produced and working with designers. Now, as a theatre choreographer, there is no structure because there's no inherent progression. So basically, you're out into the big wide world and then you have to try and get a job. It's so hard to get a job as a theatre choreographer. And then you have to get another one. Then you have to get another one. And you're also so alone. I mean, the thing about classical and contemporary choreographers is you're surrounded by classical and contemporary choreographers. And so you're nurtured. And so somebody like Robert North would say, have you thought about this? I think your composition isn't quite good here. I'm not sure I understand what this expression means. And this feels like you're repeating yourself. Whereas in theatre, you're on your own and the only people you've got to give you any sort of constructive critique is the critics. And because even in the creative team as a choreographer in theatre, you're the only person in the room that comes from a dance background and everyone else comes from text or from lighting or from sound. So you really are kind of on your own. And that's a big part of why I wanted to launch the McConey Company was because I wanted to create a dance company that was able to provide and nurture and develop theatre dancers. And in the fullness of time, I'd like to be doing the same for theatre choreographers too. I'm very pleased that choreography has worked out so well for you. (laughs) 
And one of the shows, perhaps one of the first shows of yours I saw where you were responsible for everything, direction, choreography, story, was a wonderful version of Jekyll and Hyde with a kind of Little Shop of Horrors vibe to it, which was fantastic. I remember seeing it with a friend. There's a moment where someone is kind of zipping up his trousers. A friend leant over and said, this man can make even a zip into choreography. And it was a <laughs> fantastic moment and absolutely right. And I'm wondering, do you start with situation, with character or with steps? How do you start creating? I think it, it sort of depends what thing I'm doing. It's pretty much always about the audience. And I know that might seem like a bit of a sidestep to your question, but what I mean by that is when you come from a theatre background, the sort of power dynamic is slightly different in that a theatre choreographer, a theatre maker, a theatre storyteller would consider the audience their boss. Whereas I feel like in the dance industry, the audiences come to see a singular vision of a singular choreographer or the voice of a company, shall we say. With that in mind, each process or each show requires for me, because I, I do consider the audience my boss, the process is different each time because it always comes into the question, what is the audience expecting of this production? What have they bought a ticket for? And how do I delight and surprise them while still delivering the thing that they thought they were coming to see? Because really, if you give them exactly what they want and nothing more, you're never really going to beat what was in their imagination. There's a sort of a fine line to be walked, which is to deliver exactly everything they wanted, but to kind of keep them on their toes. So I think that, you know, something like Jekyll and Hyde was very much story first. Um, and I learned a lot from Jekyll and Hyde. And I, I also choreographed a production of Merlin for Northern Ballet. And I learned a lot from that too, because moving between theatre choreography and choreography for a ballet company was that the audiences are so different. And whereas a theatre audience is expect very, very quick paced, narrative, dense beats, like constantly, dance audiences are much more sort of into allowing a, a narrative context and then for that to open up and just explode into beautiful visual emotional dance. So I think that like I'm constantly learning. I know I've maybe been doing it for quite a long time now, but I still consider myself to be like really right at the beginning of my career in many ways because I've sort of started in many different genres. Something like Jekyll and Hyde is very much story based, whereas a big challenge, and this is what's so exciting about Nutcracker for me, is that I've really challenged myself to keep the story very sort of simple in a way, very sort of human and very honest, but allowing the beats, which is what I think Nutcracker is, by the way. I think Nutcracker is an amazing opportunity for really expressive, beautiful dance. And so with Nutcracker, actually, the choreography has come a little bit before trying to fit it into a really linear narrative whereas other shows are the other way around so i'm sorry that's not the clearest of answers to your question but it's <laughs> it sort of gives an insight into, into at least what my impetus for theater making is absolutely and one of the other things you have to learn is how to lead from the front how to head a company there's a lot of pressure when you're in that role i'm thinking of something like the king kong musical you did on broadway which was clearly a monster show in every way. Huge scale, huge exposure and pressure. How do you cope with that? How do you field all the decisions that come at you? And how do you keep enjoying the work? To be honest with you, I think that's something that I spent a lot of time thinking about during the pandemic, to be honest, because I think that I learned so much again from King Kong. I mean, like, you know, to be really honest, there were big parts of King Kong that I didn't enjoy. It was such a huge responsibility. And, and like you say, a monster show, sort of monster scale, monster budget, monster pressure. And so I think that that's been a large part of really thinking about what space one person does take up in the industry and what it is you want to spend your time doing. I mean, I think for me, what is true of me before King Kong and after King Kong or before the pandemic and after the pandemic is about essentially like finding a way into making work that leads with kindness. Because I think that that's not necessarily the training we all had. You know, I don't think we were necessarily trained in artistic expression through kindness or empathy. But a huge reason of why we do what we do is to connect with people that are sitting in the dark. And I personally think that's true of whether you're doing an expressionistic art form, or whether you're doing a narrative or a literal or whatever form through which your expression or your emotion is being passed. 
I do think ultimately what it boils down to is extraordinary human standing in a space, sharing something extraordinary with somebody else who knows deep down in their heart that they are also extraordinary. So it's that thing about, I'm not personally a religious person, but I do consider theatre to be my church because it's where I think groups of people come together to hear stories that hopefully inspire them to be better and to be kinder and to be more empathetic. So I do think that in terms of finding ways of dealing with the pressure, it's like, actually, I think if I'd have let myself really fully take in the scale of King Kong, it would have not allowed me to make sure I was looking after the people that were inside that building that were also feeling all the pressure. And so I think it's about constantly looking after the people in front of you and really trying to get the room to be in a place where they feel deep pride about what it is that that they're making. And so like on a press night, I always encourage the company to go and find a quiet moment to sit and really think about what it is they feel about a show before the world tells them what they think about it. Because you can very quickly get warped by what other people think. And ultimately, your career lives and dies off your taste. And your taste can be warped by trying to please other people. And I think it's also okay to go away and be like, I know deep down in my heart, this is not a good piece of work. Um, <laughs> and, and then, but you have to stick by that, even if the next day you wake up and it's all five-star reviews, because there's so much brilliance to be learned from reviews. And the reason I've learned a lot from reviews personally, like I think that the relationship between the critic and the artist is a vital one. And so I have learned a lot from them. What you learn from them has to be alongside your own artistic taste. So I think that staying true to that is has become something really important to me. That's regardless of whether the critics are bad or good or mediocre. But really, again, it's about the people in the room making it. That calms me because you're just looking after the people in front of you and ultimately not getting too caught up in how much something is costing or the pressure or the scale and actually just think about the audience. And very often I think about my family and I think none of my family are theatre people. And I just want to sort of make work for them and therefore people like them that makes them feel like they are included in the arts and that actually dance is for everybody and it's not an exclusive thing. So that keeps me sort of focused and calm mainly. This leads us to the artist, Mm. the show you're planning next after The Nutcracker for next year, based on the multi-Oscar winning, marvellous, almost silent film, and is also about how you navigate the business, how you navigate the ups and downs of reputation and the, the business of making art. How easily, as we said, this is almost silent, does it? easily translate onto the stage the artist is something that's like become incredibly important to me it's a little bit hard really to articulate why not, but I, I think you've actually just started to pick something apart there in terms of about how one person navigates the industry and you know to be honest with you when we very first thought about it as a title it just felt initially it was like oh it's just a really good idea it's a great film we don't really have like an iconic theater experience of the silent movie era and of course it just makes sense you know silent movie dance great let's you know we'll never get the rights to it but let's like, might as well have a go, do you know what I mean? And so it was all very, like, plucky, optimistic, all of it sort of giggly, you know, it was a bit like that. But what's been fascinating about it is how, I don't mean personal as in it's just about me, but just how the sort of evolution of the show being created, it's become, like, a really unique thing. And when I met with Michel, who was the original film director and writer, in order to get the rights, He said to me, what do you think the film's about? And I said, oh, and bearing in mind that when we got the rights, we were right in the middle of the Me Too movement. And so I said, oh, I think it's about a young woman who's finding her voice in Hollywood. And that's why it's so clever to be done as a silent movie, because it's a silenced minority. He smiled and looked at the table and he said, yes, I think everybody thinks it's about that. And he said, to be honest with you, I quite like the fact that people think it's about that. But it, it actually wasn't the film I wrote. The film I wrote was about a man for whom the world is moving too fast and doesn't know how to deal with it. And in that moment, it just dawned on me. I was like, the themes that are dealt with within the piece are incredibly important. It's about a world shifting at a dramatic pace and how a man, because of patriarchy, doesn't have the skill set to be able to talk. 
And to be able to tell a story about a man finding his voice, finding out how to communicate, finding out how to essentially ask for help at the same time as a young woman arrives in Hollywood and essentially is able to climb her way to being Hollywood's greatest star because she has the ability to use her voice is an extraordinarily contemporary and important piece of theatre to be telling. Now, when you're given the gift of being able to translate an important property like the artist for the stage, you have to sit and think, okay, like, but why on stage? What is the theatrical device that unlocks this piece of storytelling to a deeper level than the film could? Because otherwise, I mean, you've already paid for your Netflix subscription. Go and watch it. <laughs> so why are you coming out of your home, away from watching the Oscar-winning film to come and see this expressed in a new way? And it comes back to the Nutcracker thing of we have to find a way to give you more than what you thought you knew about the title. And, and you need to find a contemporary way to connect to it on a human level. So what's been really interesting, and, and actually... Right at the beginning of this podcast, you mentioned the artist and you said that we were developing the musical of the artist. And it's really interesting because we got asked a lot about whether the artist is a musical or whether it's a ballet. Yes. And it's one of these things where um, it's essentially neither and both. And what I mean by that is that essentially as the thing that is different, I mean, I'm sort of giving away some tricks here, but the aspect of the protagonist moving from a character who can't speak and learning how to speak, as we move from the silent movie era into the talkies, we are also shifting from a silent on stage storytelling device to the use of sound. So we watch as the characters learn to be able to use their voices, moving from open vowel sounds through to the ability to start to speak, all the way through to landing in sort of one of the great MGM Hollywood movie musical making machines. Whereas in the movie, there is just sort of a handful of lines at the very, very end of the film before the credits roll. Basically, as Peppy Miller, the young, a sort of rising female star comes into the picture, she brings a voice with her and that the world changes forever. And so, whereas at the very beginning of the piece, the world revolves around George Valentin and his ability to tell stories through dance. By the end of the piece, dance and music and song and voice collide as the man and the woman come together in harmony and the world sort of is forever changed by hope and optimism. So it's funny because some people who've come to see the workshop, we've done two workshops of it, have sort of been going, oh, it's a brand new genre, it's genre defined. And I'm like, it sort of isn't. Like, I don't think it is genre defining or genre. Defined. There's not a single thing in the artist that hasn't been done before. In fact, actually, pretty much everything we're doing in the artist is stuff from almost the olden days, apart from our use of projection. But there's something about the way those storytelling devices are being used in parallel with the character's emotional development that feels like very exciting and for a you know a piece set in the 1920s with not a single thing that isn't period again other than the projection it feels wildly modern as you can probably tell it's something i'm really excited about and i think it's something that's going to be perfect example of exactly why i launched the company because only these type of dancers could pull that off and though this might also not be the line you want to go with on the poster the artist is about how you bring your authentic self to the work you do and it does feel from our conversation as if that's something that you've always got a sense of what it is in a project that really calls to you and what you can bring to it not just as a choreographer and a director but what heart and soul you can put into a project yeah i mean a hundred percent I sort of appreciate you acknowledging that because I think that is what is different. Like me coming from essentially a ballet school and like a dance led school, I, I think that we are in pursuit of that. And I think sometimes in the theatre industry, you can be treated as sort of a tradesman for hire where you come in. And, and so I think that trying to find my way through wanting to be that choreographer or that director that creates work that can touch people and have a lasting impact on them because of their experience of the world. Like, I feel like I've been really conscious of trying to navigate taking on the projects where I can have that communication with the audience. The reason I'm sort of not struggling, but the, the reason I'm sort of, I guess, hesitating on the answer is that it's a weird thing because I also don't necessarily think it's about me. I don't go into these shows going, oh, how can I be recognized or remembered almost it's like i think about my background is not one that necessarily had an obvious access into going to see dance i did go to ballet in the end but ballet definitely when i did get to start training in ballet all the children that were going to ballet were from very different families to mine you know there were 
very sort of middle to upper class families. And the sort of the culture of the sort of family that I was from was more that sort of disco freestyle. And so I guess in a way, I've always wanted to be trying to get back to finding ways of making more people feel like they belong in my work. And I've tried to access my own humanity in able to access theirs. I guess, you know, two things can be true, right? I can be in pursuit of trying to have a personal response, but in order to access many people rather than being about me, I hope. I didn't mean to suggest that all of your productions could be subtitled The Drew McConey <laughs> Story. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. <laughs> King Kong, The Drew McConey oh, Story. Oh, God, well, that would be... does have a ring to it. <laughs> that would be terrifying, yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering, at this moment when you're starting a family of your own, has dance also been a family to you? Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, I think that I would imagine that pretty much everybody that listens to this podcast that would feel like they belong to something. I mean, I, I think about everybody trying to find their place in the world. And I think also another thing as a gay man is that we're, we're very used to choosing our family in a way. I mean, I was very lucky that my family accepted me, but a lot of my friends and a lot of my other family, my sort of non-blood family, didn't have such great experiences with their own family. And so as gay people, we're very used to finding our own family. But I, I don't think that that's just limited to people who identify as queer. I think that is also true of dancers. It's such an extraordinary thing that people love in dance. It's such a primal. Uh, and I think that a lot of people choose to dance um, despite social norms, etc. And the other thing as well about dance is it costs you so much. And it does cost money, but that isn't what I mean. Growing up, if you're going to be a dancer, it has to be who you are, right, from a very early age. And so when other people are going out and doing things and experiencing different things, it can cost you friendships and it can put you in different situations. And so I do think people find their tribe, find their families within dance. And I acknowledge that in the companies and the casts that I work with. I acknowledge it in the young people I teach and train. And I acknowledge it in myself as well. There's a certain calm or there's a certain humor or there's a certain sort of unspoken communication that happens within and by the way I'm not just talking about performing dance I mean I consider sort of everybody who goes to the theater who loves dance a dancer you know it's just whether you dance with your body or whether you dance in your imagination but there is an unspoken sort of sense of community and a sense of family within within the dance industry that I adore. Drew we're going to let you go but we can't do that before we ask the final question which is why does dance matter? to you? Dance matters to me because it was where I sort of found my first home. It was where I stood up in front of other people who seemed to want to scream as much as I did every time the music came on. It was a place where I felt like I belonged. It was a place where I felt like I wasn't alone in my own imagination. And really dance was a place that gave me the strength to ignore my geography teacher when she said that daydreaming wouldn't amount to anything. And so for that, really, I consider the most valuable thing that I own is my passion and dance was the thing that gave me that and it was the thing that made me believe in protecting it. Drew McConey, daydreamer, choreographer, it has been an absolute joy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. I love that you can almost hear the whir of Drew's brain. The talk just tumbles out of him. That was a whiz-bang start to our new season. I really hope you enjoyed it and that you'll enjoy the episodes to come with New York's star choreographer, Pam Tanowitz, with English National Ballet director, Aaron Watkin, and with a medalist from the RAD's Margot Fontaine International Ballet Competition and more. Please do subscribe and like the podcast so that you don't miss an episode. The RAD's socials are in our show notes, where you'll also find links to Drew's doings, including his Nutcracker at the Tough Nut Jazz Club on London South Bank. Our guest today was Drew McConey. Why Dance Matters is made with the RAD team of Neve Carey Furness, Keisha Dodd and Katie Hagen. Our artwork is by Bex Glendinning and the podcast's resident sugar plum fairy is our producer, Sarah Miles. I'm David Jays. Take care and see you soon.